So the architecture of our sourdough's crumb signifies that everything's come together just right, or that we've got things horribly wrong. But I think that focusing on achieving the crumb that we desire will also sort out lots of other problems like flat or deflated loaves. If the crumb's right, then there's a good chance everything else is gonna be pretty good too. But we mustn't forget that visuals are only part of the story. The way the crumb tastes and its mouthfeel are also important players when it comes to deciding what the perfect crumb is. Now the definition of a perfect crumb is subjective. Perhaps you're shooting for kind of an open structure with lots of holes, or maybe you prefer a tighter woven crumb with deep flavors from whole wheat flour. I like something in the middle, I guess. And while I'm still in search of perfection, I wanted to share the critical steps that you're gonna to need to get right to succeed and reach your goal. So to have a successful baking session, we need to make sure that our sourdough culture is vibrant and healthy. Now, when you're feeding your starter or creating a levan or using the scraping method, you're gonna to need to make sure that the sourdough culture that you use to make the dough is properly fermented. It's ready to use. Practice scheduling so that you're able to feed your starter or create your levan the night before baking so that it ferments overnight and it's ready to use first thing in the morning. Now I use 10% of starter to flour. So 50 grams of flour, 50 grams of water, and five grams of sourdough culture. At around 20 to 25 degrees Celsius in my kitchen, my sourdough culture takes about 10 hours to ferment, which is perfect for an overnight schedule. If you start your baking process too late in the morning, you might run out of time. You might rush the fermentation or the proving stage. Give yourself a head start, practice scheduling, and relieve the pressure. Now, the type of flour that you choose to use is gonna have a dramatic impact on the crumb of your sourdough. There definitely isn't one size that fits all. Now, if you're looking for that open structure with lots of holes, then you should definitely use a strong white bread flour made from wheat. Now, the higher the protein content of that flour, the stronger the resulting dough. And a strong dough will be able to retain that open structure in the crumb. I guess I consider a strong bread flour to have a protein content upward of 12%, but remember, the stronger the flour or the higher the protein content, the chewier the product. So the resulting crumb is gonna have a chewier texture. And this is where I think soft all-purpose flour can be overlooked. It's got a lower protein content, normally between 10 to 12%, and it does produce a tighter crumb, but it also produces a wonderfully soft texture. Now adding whole wheat flour will in my mind improve the overall flavor of the crumb and up to a certain point I think it makes it softer too. But the more whole wheat you add the denser the crumb will become. So if you're shooting for that wide open crumb then you might want to keep the addition of whole wheat flour to a minimum maybe around 10% or so. But if you want a more nutrient dense softer tighter crumb then adding more whole wheat could well be the way to go. And of course, we mustn't forget that adding other types of flour such as rye or spelt is gonna impact the flavor, the texture, and the architecture. So a good plan is to start baking with say 100% strong white bread flour and then gradually include a second flour in 10% increments. That way you can observe the impact on the structure, the flavor, and the texture of the crumb. Now it doesn't matter if you choose to use strong white bread flour or a blend of two to three different flours. You're gonna to need to balance the hydration correctly. The lower the hydration, the stiffer the dough and the tighter the crumb might be. The higher the hydration, the more kind of extensible the dough and the more chance you've got of an open crumb. But the higher the hydration, the harder the dough is to handle and the more chance you have of the dough collapsing and up go the chances of having a really sticky kind of gummy crumb. Now I think the mark of a good baker is knowing how to match the hydration to the flour to obtain the desired results. And there are two kind of important considerations. The first, the flour's absorption capability. How much water can it take on board? And second, the baker's capability of handling that dough. That's down to me and you. Now, if you're struggling with hydration and your loaves tend to be kind of flat or the dough is really sticky and tricky to handle, 
I'd suggest knocking that hydration all the way down to 65%. Bake a few loaves, get used to the feel of the dough, and make sure you're getting your fermentation and your proving on point. Once these are aligned, you can increase that hydration by two to 3% and then bake a few more loaves. It's just a case of repeating this process until you're completely comfortable handling the dough and you're reaching the hydration that's producing the kind of results you wanna see in your crumb. But believe you me when I say that higher definitely isn't always better. Now to make balancing the hydration with the flour easier, download my free sourdough calculator. It's a spreadsheet that makes tweaking your recipe super simple. And once you've downloaded it, you'll also be notified when I launch my free calculator training. Now to achieve a crumb that's properly baked and isn't gummy, you're gonna to need to make sure that your dough is fermented correctly. This sounds easy, but it's gotta be one of the trickiest things to get to grips with. Now I think there are three ways to judge when the dough is fermented correctly. We can judge it by volume, the amount it increases. We can monitor the dough's pH, or we can become accustomed to handling the dough, developing our senses, and use our experience and intuition to know when that dough is correctly fermented. Now for beginners, I'd suggest using volume. After you mix your dough, complete your stretching or your folding and your lamination sequence, whichever it is, and then leave the dough in a large container to increase in volume by 75% of its original size, and then you move on to shaping. Now it doesn't need to be spot on, but if you're in that ballpark of 75%, you should avoid under or over fermenting your dough. Now I like to ferment my dough in a bowl, but some home bakers find it easier to use a see-through straight-sided container. That way they can mark the level of the dough, making it a lot easier to monitor how much it increases in volume. But make sure you smell and you touch the dough throughout the process. By doing this, you'll get used to the way the dough feels and smells, and you'll become less reliant on using volume alone. Don't be afraid to taste the dough too. You can learn a lot about the acidity. And try to remember that just because a recipe tells you to ferment the dough for six hours, it doesn't mean it's right. It's most likely that your variables, your starter, your choice of flour, and the temperature are different to the variables in the recipe. You need to be in complete control of your own fermentation. Now you can make a really decent loaf of sourdough without laminating or stretching and folding the dough. I've got a couple of no-knead sourdough videos right here on the channel, but I found that my no-knead loaves yield kind of this random disorganized crumb. And when I manipulate the dough by laminating or stretching and folding, I get a much more organized kind of uniform crumb. Now I don't have a preference. I really like them both. They're just different. And I think it's worth mentioning that neither my wife, my daughter, or my friends ever mention the structure of the crumb, but they're very quick to give me their opinion on the taste and texture. And for me, that puts everything into perspective about the importance of the crumb. Now I found I've got better control over the crumb when I really focus on the shaping stage. I've become quite, I guess, firm with my touch. I don't degas the dough too much, but I do make sure that I apply quite a bit of pressure to it. My aim is to really compact the dough and the gas and then envelop it by creating a taut dough and make sure that it's well sealed. This kind of produces a really nice even rise in the basket. Now I don't always pre-shape, but it can certainly help with creating some tension in the dough before that final shape. And I like to think of the shaping process as our last opportunity to kind of organize the dough before it's baked. Right, so the proving stage can kind of make or break all of that hard work that we've put in so far. So after shaping the dough, we need to pop it into a sourdough basket to prove. During this stage, the dough continues to ferment and it increases in volume to kind of fill the basket or take the shape of the basket. Imagine the starting point of the proving is when the dough is tightly formed after shaping. Now imagine the terminal point of the proving is when the dough's kind of expanded so much that the strength of the dough kind of can't support it and it starts to deflate a little. Our job is to catch the dough when it's expanded appreciably but isn't in danger of collapsing. And the most reliable way of testing this is to touch the dough. 
Now, lots of people call this the poke test. The dough should feel pillowy and puffy inside. The skin of the dough should feel strong and capable of supporting it, but it shouldn't feel kind of tight like a drum, as if it's constricting the dough. Now, while you're touching the dough, you should also observe how it looks and how much it fills the basket. And then if you stick with making the same recipe and proving in the same basket, you'll very, very quickly learn how to notice when your dough is perfectly proved. Now, if your dough is underproved, you may end up with big craters in the crumb or the loaf might kind of burst during baking. Overprove the dough and it could well, you know, slightly deflate and lose volume and that might result in a tighter crumb. Now, after we've done all of this hard work, we need to make sure we score the dough correctly and I'm gonna leave a link to that video down below. So you're probably thinking, well, basically I need to get everything right and spend a load of time practicing. Well, you'd be spot on. I've made a huge amount of mistakes and I'm still making plenty, but one thing I've come to understand is that there aren't any shortcuts to baking a decent loaf. A decent loaf of sourdough really is greater than the sum of its parts. But what I can promise you is that the more you practice, the better you'll get at these stages. You're gonna see drastic improvement in your baking. You'll get closer to producing a crumb that not only looks great, but tastes even better. Join me in this video right here to learn how to make a well-mixed, bulletproof dough quickly. And don't forget, grab the calculator linked below. A huge thank you for watching. I'll see you again very soon. Stay tuned.